All right, so the next talk is Max Kraminski on AI support for player storytelling in digital games. Um, so take it away, Max. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so hey, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Max. I'm a PhD student in computational media, um, specifically in the Expressive Intelligence Studio at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I'm going to be talking, as Josh just said, about AI support for player storytelling in digital games, and specifically on my work towards um, sort of providing better support for player storytelling in digital games than is already extant, obviously. Um, before I get into the technology and sort of design part of this talk, I'm going to go into a little bit of, of background about um, the use of generative games as storytelling partners, especially as it's already being used for this purpose today. Um, then I'm going to get into uh, story sifting technology, which is sort of the, the technology we're developing to try and um, support this kind of player storytelling behavior, and then get a little bit into these novel play experiences that we're trying to build using this technology and these design insights. And that includes a game called Why Are We Like This, um, which is a collaboration with my, my collaborator, Melanie Dickinson, um, which sort of tries to take the story sifting stuff and this design knowledge and um, build a game that is fundamentally about the play pleasure of authoring a story with the computer. So I think the best way to get into the background here is to start with this quote from Boat Murdered, which is a relatively famous slash infamous um, Dwarf Fortress story. All eras of Boat Murdered history are highly noteworthy and interesting. Things very quickly progressed from somewhat casual daily elephant deaths to retired rulers rampaging and beating people to death while burning alive. The heavy downward slide that would come to define Boat Murdered seems to have begun during Stark Raving Mad's rule with the utterly epic Elephant War. So this is actually a pretty typical Dwarf Fortress story as they go. Um, Dwarf Fortress stories tend to be about the uh, gradual rise and sudden meteoric decline of Dwarf Fortress civilizations. Um, if you're not familiar, Dwarf Fortress is a game about sort of going out into the world with a little colony of dwarves, founding, founding a fortress, um, digging into the rock, collecting resources, trying to grow your population, and dealing with uh, a very hostile and threatening world. Um, and Boat Murdered in particular is a, is a chain retelling. So it was started by one player on a forum. Um, I believe they played for one in-game year, then passed along the save file to a different player who, who did, again played for one in-game year, then passed it along and so on. And the end result is that each of these players wrote up like a chronicle of what happened in the fortress during their rule and stitched them together end to end. And the end result is Boat Murdered. Um, another popular Dwarf Fortress story, or well, sort of well-known Dwarf Fortress story is Bronze Murder, um, which is actually illustrated by Tim Denis. Um, who has illustrated a number of Dwarf Fortress stories in the past. And you can see here that same sort of overall structural pattern of the, the fortress succumbing to a sudden disaster, in this case, a, a monster that gets lured from the pump below um, and sort of makes its way through the fortress, killing everybody as it goes. So I'm, I'm calling these out as exemplars of retellings. And retellings in this context are stories either written or otherwise sort of recorded by players about their play experiences in games. And in interactive narrative and generative narrative research recently, there's been a call for a focus on retellings, um, sort of arguing that if there's players doing retellings of gameplay in, in a game, that's a sign that that game is, is somehow supporting player storytelling or is somehow like um, providing a narratively coherent or narratively compelling experience that makes players want to share what they've experienced with others. And in my own work, I've made a distinction between what I call monologic and dialogic retellings, where monologic retellings are basically instances of players taking the game and using it as a canvas on which they enact like a pre-planned story um, without really taking the game systems into account. And you see this in Sims communities sometimes where players basically use it as a way to pose like paper dolls um, in certain sort of like 3D digital environments without really taking the game systems into account. Versus the kind that I'm interested in more here are dialogic retellings, where the player is taking significant creative input from the game and systems, letting the game mechanics um, and sort of letting unexpected or unplanned game events um, into the story and sort of allowing the game to contribute meaningfully as a creative participant in the storytelling process. So um, there's a lot of examples out there of dialogic retellings. I've studied these more closely in some of the papers that I'll talk about or that I'll sort of like point out at the end. Um, Alice and Kev is a pretty famous story of being a homeless father and daughter in The Sims 3. Mattel Remeret is a Dwarf Fortress story again that's about like um, sort of, it's told from the perspective of a series of diary entries, one per dwarf per year. And it was put together by a team of like five different people, including a writer and an illustrator and a, a person who created the soundtrack for it and so on. Um, Pro Vercelli is a lengthy episodic football manager 2009 retelling by an actual um, sports writer. And then there's some specific games that have just lots and lots of retellings and very strong sort of cultures in their player communities of creating and sharing retellings of gameplay. And that includes things like Dwarf Fortress and the Sims series. Um, the Sims people actually call what they do Simlet. It's a whole subculture. And then grand strategy games by the Paradox Studio in particular, such as Crusader Kings and Stellaris. 
And all of these games have some things in common, especially the fact that they have like generative or simulationist or AI driven aspects of gameplay. And uh, my hypothesis is that um, storytelling focused players seek out these games deliberately because they provide players with creativity support by helping them get around these common barriers to creativity that a lot of people face. Um, and this includes things like fear of the blank canvas. So if you have trouble getting started, then having an initial sort of generative scenario to help you get started might be like a, a thing that the game provides for you. Um, fear of judgment. You can often in these kinds of storytelling situations defer creative responsibility for decisions that you're criticized on to the game and say it was the game that did that and not me, while still taking creative credit for the decisions that you made that, that you think are good. Um, writer's block is the problem of getting stuck halfway through a story or not knowing what should happen next. And a lot of these games also provide things that sort of keep the story moving along regardless of whether you're sure what should happen next, including in Boat Murdered in particular, the fortress was constantly plagued by these elf attacks that repeatedly came in and destabilized it when things were looking stable. And then perfectionism also can benefit from some of the same design aspects, or rather can, can be prevented by some of the same design aspects. So um, that brings us to the pain of emergent narrative. These games aren't just unilaterally great for, or just uniformly great for storytelling. They also have some downsides as well. And so James Ryan here is a PhD student, or was a PhD student in my lab, um, co-advised by Michael Mateus, who's also my advisor now. Um, and Michael um, has, in James' words, uh, offered this critique of emergent narrative. It's just one damn thing after another. I actually want to rephrase this um, a little bit and reframe it more as um, the problem really is that everything happens so much in these games, right? There's just piles and piles on piles on piles of relatively insignificant events. And it gets very rapidly to this point of complete overwhelm where there's so much irrelevant detail in this world that you don't know what you should focus on or what you should tell your story about really. And so the problem fundamentally in James's view at least is that you need to curate the, the events that are happening. So traditionally, emergent narrative work tends to take the simulated story world itself, like all of the stuff that has happened, as the story. And James's argument is that this is actually better if we look at this as a series of filtering processes that eventually produce a story. So starting from the simulated story world, you have a chronicler that turns it into a sequence of events that are sort of like easily um, filterable or sortable or whatever. You've got a story sifter, which is the thing that we're focused on here mostly in this work, um, which takes chronicled events and then tries to extract narratively interesting material from those events, which can be little sequences of events that maybe have like sort of narrative miniature arcs to them. Then this material gets crafted into a full story by a narrativizer, which could be a player, it could be a computer system, either way. And the end result of this process is the emergent narrative, not just the thing that you start out with, which is the whole story world. And that brings us to story sifting, which is sort of the technological approach that we most recently have sort of developed in the, in the pursuit of this goal of curationist emergent narrative. The basic idea behind story sifting is that you take these massive databases of events that are produced by these simulations and filter them down to just a few that you care about, and then look at these events as sort of micro stories, basically. So in this case, you can imagine a story that's, that consists of these events in sequence. A character A starts a project, um, decides the project isn't any good, gives up on it, then a second character B comes and talks to A about the project several times um, persistently. And then in the end, A finally decides to resume work on this project. So this isn't like a fantastic story in and of itself. It's not gonna win any awards or anything like that, but it is an interesting sort of nugget of narrative experience that has an arc to it and that you might want to incorporate as a player who's there for storytelling purposes into the overall story that you're weaving together. So you might have lots and lots of these little chunks of story that you're trying to sort of assemble into a larger narrative. And the game's job, or the, well, the sifter's job, is to pull out these little chunks and provide them to you in a way that you can then work with them. And the way that we do this so far is with sifting patterns, which are basically specifications of groups of interrelated events that we think make for good or compelling narrative building blocks. And ideally, you want to have a whole lot of these because the goal is to produce diversity in the kinds of things you're surfacing to the player. Um, this diversity enables a greater diversity of player stories that they can create. It sort of prompts players to be more creative. It sort of creates this larger story volume is the term that we often use for it in the emergent narrative community. Um, and because you want to have a lot of different sifting patterns surfacing a lot of different kinds of events, you should ideally make these patterns as easy to author as possible. Um, one of the systems that I've developed is this, uh, it's called felt, it's a story sifter and felt sifting patterns look kind of like this. This is a moderately complicated one. It's intended to match a sequence of two betrayals that the same character who is impulsive does in a row um, with no other actions by that same character in between. So it consists of like a few different clauses. This part is saying there's two event sequence or there's two events in sequence, event A and event B, and things with question marks in front of them are variables. Um, then you have like event A has the event type of betray. Event A has the actor of care who is the character doing the betraying. 
And then at the end here, you've got this complicated bit that's basically saying, and make sure that in between event A and event B, there's not a third event perpetrated by that same character. So these betrayals have to be back to back, basically. Um, this is noticeably different. Oh, sorry. This is um, implemented in DataScript, which is a JavaScript implementation of Datalog. And Datalog is a declarative query language that you can run against databases. Um, basically, these patterns all desugar to Datalog ultimately. And that's useful for stuff that we're doing in the future, but it's not super significant right now. Um, so James's systems, James Ryan's systems, um, tend to use procedural Python code for the sifting patterns, um, which looks more like this. And the comparison that you can see is that like the felt sifting pattern consists of a few smaller, like more uh, machine readable statements, which is useful because it means that you can procedurally generate these. It means you can use these in more different sort of like, um, you can have the computer like sort of reason about them more readily by parsing it into its distinct clauses and like sort of comparing the results you get by removing some of these clauses, adding some other ones and so on. You can also work these directly into the simulation that you're building as action preconditions. So in this case, we've got an instance of a, a character sort of swearing revenge against another and then burning down a building owned by this other character as a revenge sort of action. Um, and if we add this one bit at the end where also there's some bystander who was harmed by the person who was the victim of the revenge sequence, then the, the bystander can form some judgments, for instance, about, oh yeah, that revenge victim probably totally deserved it because they were mean to me this one time. And also that arsonist is a good person because they got revenge on this bad person. Um, and so this basically lets you have characters who are themselves going from this like sort of objective reality of all of the different events that have happened in the world and filtering it through a particular viewpoint to just the ones that matter to them. And you can have different characters do the same filtering on the same set of events. And even though it's all the same mishmash to begin with, different characters come away with very different stories that they're telling themselves and therefore um, act in very different ways, which can lead to emergent procedural conflict, which is great for storytelling purposes. And that leads us to this idea of characters having um, internal actions, where they basically look at events that have happened in the world through the lens of a particular sifting pattern, tell themselves a particular story about it, and then act on the world in response to that. So a character might sort of decide, oh, this character has done a bunch of mean things to me. They must be a mean person, and I should get revenge on them. But a character with different sifting patterns might also instead go, oh, this person's probably having a bad day. I should be nicer to them. And that these actions can then motivate characters to do things like sabotage an experiment in revenge, for instance, or bake a cake and give it to this person, or tell another character that this third character is not to be trusted, stuff like that. And that also brings us to this idea of, oh, idea, to the project of why are we like this, which is um, the game that I'm developing with Melanie Dickinson right now that sort of incorporates all of this technology and all of these design insights. So why are we like this is a game about basically picking actions that are suggested to you by the simulation. You can see here that there's like five different actions that are, that are suggested right now. Um, some of these are internal actions where there's characters thinking about things or worrying about things. Some of these are external actions where their characters acting directly on the world. Um, you can see that there's these sort of red and yellow boxes on the right on some of them, which are uh, author goals. And author goals are things that you as the player provide to the system to explain what it is you want to accomplish narratively in this scene of the story. So in this case, there's a player who has picked like two author goals here, involve Bella in the plot and escalate the conflict of progress versus order, which are like values the characters can hold maybe. Um, and the system is surfacing deliberately actions that the characters would perform according to the internal model of like what preconditions are on actions and what characters might want to do for, for their various motivations. But also trying to pick out the actions that best advance the author goals that the players have specified. And once you pick an action, it gets added to a transcript like this. And the transcript here includes two different sort of components. There's the bold taglines, which are sort of the system generated terse descriptions of each action that has happened. And then there's these um, non-bold text below each one, and that's editable by the players. And what the players are doing here basically is writing a story in conjunction with the machine where they get the opportunity to pick an action, then sort of elaborate on it by providing like character dialogue or more detailed description, um, or just getting into like what this action means in the context of the story that we're trying to tell. And at the end of a play session, this transcript is the, the retelling of the play session, basically. The goal of, the, the goal of play is through authorship with the, with the machine to create like one of these stories. Um, this is sort of an overall system diagram of why are we like this. You can see that there's characters um, like performing autonomous actions a little bit in the background as well. But the, the core interaction pattern is of players choosing author goals, viewing action suggestions, and then picking actions to perform and narrativize in the story. And then there's also the story world investigator thing, which lets players sort of like delve into the background of what's happened in the world. So like look at events that have happened in the past, look at the relationships between characters and just get like a lot more detailed information on all the different story world entities that exist.
so yeah, uh, in conclusion, there's three things that I want to get to. Um, one of them is that there's these new kinds of intelligent narrative technologies that are geared towards mixed initiative use and creativity support. And we can use these to enable new kinds of story construction play experiences, games that are fundamentally about the process of co-authoring with the computer and not just about sort of like stories falling out incidentally along the way. Um, number two is that story sifting in particular is an especially promising sort of technological direction to pursue for providing players with this kind of creativity support. And number three is that we should study really closely the existing um, player practices around storytelling in games, um, because that can actually tell us a whole lot about what works and what doesn't and why that might be the case. So yeah, this has been sort of a synopsis of these six papers, basically. Um, you can go to my website, mkrmins.github.io, and sort of view all of these if you want. You can hit me up on Twitter at Max Kraminsky, and I believe that's all. So thank you. Wow, that was an awesome talk, and my timer just went off, so you were perfectly <laughs> in time. It's a great job. Um, super cool talk. So this really jogs my memory or my brain because it really remind makes me think about my work and makes me think about other people's work. But I'm wondering, uh, mainly regarding like the story sifting part of the work, but maybe even other parts of the system. Like, would it be of use to you if you had a way to automatically like extract plots from other, from like written stories or from like a database of stories that you're interested in the context of your game? Like if you were able to extract a bunch of plots and motifs and turning points and emotions of characters from stories, would that be of use to you in the system? I think absolutely, yeah. Um, so I didn't get into this as, as much as I'd like to because it's a pretty short talk, but also there's this idea in addition to story sifting patterns, which are fairly like detailed, of story sifting heuristics, right? And this is from James Ryan's dissertation, which talks a lot more about this idea of curationist emergent narrative. Yeah. And um, sifting heuristics are trying to be like general patterns about what is storyful, like at large, basically. And the idea is that you can use sifting patterns in conjunction with sifting heuristics, which are more general, to like guide the assembly of sifting patterns, sort of sifted sequences into these larger um, overall narrative structures. So we haven't tackled that yet in this work as much, but there's stuff like Indexter out there that sort of like talks about event relatedness and how that sort of influences storyfulness. Um, and I think that that stuff is is sort of like, there's a lot of potential to take it and turn it into sifting heuristics that then work with sifting patterns to produce like better stories by default, basically. Yeah, we should definitely talk because my whole work in PhD and even work after the PhD has been on what you would call like sifting heuristics, like extracting mm -hmm. features of narrative automatically for use of other systems. So I'd love to help in some way and to yeah, talk be awesome. further because what you're doing is really cool. <laughs> All right. 